but sometimes this comes up for in psychedelic journeys. A lot of times this comes up in powerful psychedelic journeys. And, and so having a, a route to explore some of these deeper questions, these deeper mysteries um, is a real benefit of non-ordinary states. We don't need these non-ordinary states to ask some of these questions and explore these uh, topics, but it can be a catalyst for doing that. everyone and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. Quick shout out to all of you for all your support so far on the project. Keep helping me spread the word by sharing the shows with all your friends and if you can give me a five star rating on iTunes that will be amazing as well. And for those of you who want to support my work directly they can make a contribution on PayPal via the website or become a Patreon um, and that can just help me keep pumping this, this content out long term because I'm absolutely having the time of my life here. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook to be kept up with all of the new shows that are coming out and keep feeding back to me with guest suggestions and, and all of your ideas about, about these important subjects we're discussing. So today we have the fascinating topic of psychedelic integration to get our heads around. Now, integration is a crucial part of any psychotherapy process, but perhaps even more so when those suffering are experiencing psychedelic compounds in their treatment programs. Now, many subjects of the new psychedelic treatments for depression and ADHD have life-changing experiences that often go against everything they've come to believe about themselves and the world. So regardless of how positive they can be to the meaning of their lives, it's pretty clear that some sensitive guidance and process Processing needs to take place for the therapy to really shift their day-to-day -day life in the long term. So who better to help us explain all of this and offer some tools for navigating these tricky experiences than clinical psychologist and author Dr. Kyle Ortigo. Kyle is the founder of the Center for Existential Exploration in Palo Alto, California. He's hugely influenced by my hero, psychologist Carl Jung, and he specializes in treating trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and addiction with a particular sensitivity to gender identity issues. Now, I have wanted to speak to a psychedelic therapist about the difficulty of integrating these deeply existential psychedelic treatments ever since hearing it was being used for psychotherapy. So I really can't wait to get into this. So without further ado, let's go. Dr. Kyle Ortiga, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. How are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Happy to start this new year. Well, before getting into uh, psychedelic integration, Carl, I'd just love to find out from my guests, what were their first conscious thoughts and deep questions when they just first started to creep into consciousness when they were adolescents? What were the burning questions that you remember that may have started a chain reaction that led you to where you are now? Yeah, well, I remember having some burning questions before adolescence, but when I was in my early teenage years, uh, this is very developmentally appropriate. I learned later as a psychologist, but I had questions around identity, who am I, where do I belong? And these, these questions uh, were, were definitely front and center for me. And um, throughout my adolescence, they, they evolved and changed over time through some of my explorations of literature and some of my independent readings I was doing. And I remember I, I kind of lucked out going to a, a public university in small town, rural Arkansas, that I had an English professor who was very uh, supportive of me doing my senior English paper on Bram Stoker's Dracula. And that's actually where I first came across a reading by Freud on The Uncanny. And the uncanny was one framework that I used to interpret that, that book. And it had definitely some connections later when I came across Jung's idea of the shadow, the parts of ourselves that we're deeply uncomfortable with. And uh, some of my creative writing at the time was also a way to explore these questions. And that was really around two 
what what are we if we were to forget all of our our memories and our experiences are are we the same or are we a completely new entity person i mean how deep does consciousness go uh, is is there a soul like all these things you know it's just you know, typical teenager thoughts I was having, I think, but it led me very quickly and easily to psychology because I figured that was a route to explore some of these philosophical questions while also having some practical benefits, uh, given that we all have to deal with ourselves, our emotions and and relationships. Um, But I I took a few detours along the way into film studies, and that's where I I continued to explore the the second dynamic thoughts um, from Jung and and introduced me to Joseph Campbell as well, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Okay. So for any of you listeners that are new to this uh, question about the use of psychedelics for treating mental health conditions, please do go back to episode 10 with psychologist Ashley Murphy Biner, who's been working on the Imperial Studies, because there we go into the nuts and bolts of how this kind of treatment model is applied and how they've been testing its efficacy uh, and the papers that have been coming out to sort of to study that. But today we're going to be focusing a little more on the psychedelic integration element of these kind of therapies and the tools and the awareness that Carl's suggesting we, we use alongside this treatment. So to understand the importance of psychedelic integration, which is one of the topics of your new book, Kyle, Beyond the Narrow Life, uh, Psychedelic Integration and Existential Exploration, we first need to understand the importance of integration in therapy in general. So tell us, what what is integration in the psychiatric context and and why is it so important to integrate these learnings for, for a therapy to work? Well, integration can mean a few different things depending on how we're using it. So it depends even within that mental health context. I'd say one definition uh, that is consistent to this broader topic is the integration of self, different parts of oneself. Another is an integration of new insights or new learnings or new experiences into one's worldview, views of self, others, and, and life and our behavior, what we do, how we approach life. Within uh, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, that short term, the integration may be very specific about any new skills that one is learning and applying related to emotion regulation, coping strategies or communication strategies, relationship patterns within more long-term depth-oriented psychodynamic approaches like Jungian analysis, there may be more of an emphasis on exploration of these different parts of ourselves and looking at symbols that show up in dreams or with art that we deeply resonate with. And certainly this fits too within psychedelic experiences or other non-ordinary states of consciousness, like through holotropic breathwork you mentioned, but also through other powerful life experiences and spontaneous non-ordinary states. How do we make sense of these experiences and are there any genuine insights that we can gain? And if so, how do we apply those to our lives? The metaphor that I think fits the best with this is one of translation. How do we translate experiences or these symbols into actual insights that we can then apply through behavior? And that translation process is challenging and it can be challenging in different ways. Certainly it's more so with psychedelic experiences or things that are just completely outside of the realm of our normal everyday experience or sense of self or reality. But I think it's that process of actually trying to understand, exploring, being able to tolerate the ambiguity of it all and see the the various possible layers of meaning while um, seeing what we can do differently in life, whether that's helping us connect to a deeper sense of meaning or a sense of groundedness uh, in, in spite of these complexities. Well, presumably, it's even more important in the case of, the, of you know, we mentioned the holotropic breathing or psychedelics from the most intense of all, perhaps, where there could be some confusion. I mean, remember, we're dealing with people with mental health issues. You know, there could be some confusion about what all of this means, how, you know, how to integrate it. If we're talking about psychedelic integration, how do those goalposts move? Is it is it are the objectives different than what you've just been describing? 
I don't think they're necessarily different when we're talking about these broad definitions and understandings, but certainly when we get down to the individual, they may be quite different. And certainly the complexity of these themes, um, kind of the, the weight philosophically, personally, cosmically, to some of the things that can be experienced or explored in non-ordinary states is of a different degree sometimes a different quality than what you would normally get through just talk therapy, certainly if it's short-term and focus on symptom reduction or something like that. Um, I, I certainly have, because of my practice and areas of expertise, I, I have uh, clients that talk to me about the cosmos and things like that, but uh, that's, that's because they know that's uh, an area that's safe and important and of interest to explore and, and the work that I do. But sometimes this comes up for in psychedelic journeys. A lot of times this comes up in powerful psychedelic journeys. And, and so having a, a route to explore some of these deeper questions, these deeper mysteries, um, is a real benefit of non-ordinary states. We don't need these non-ordinary states to ask some of these questions and explore these uh, topics, but it can be a catalyst for doing that. Uh, in thinking too about and in, in within a psychedelic journey, just so much can come up, even with one person across different journeys that that it, it's hard to really say that th this is what it is. This is what the integration process is. Um, so it's important to to have these broader understandings of these processes, these definitions, and then know that everyone's journey is going to be different and unique to them. Mm. So in the new book, you present a, just an extraordinary wealth of awarenesses to keep in mind, um, which you helpfully sort of break into three arcs, as you call them. So this, this first arc is about expanding that awareness to prepare for the unknown. Now, this is important to me because, because Jung spoke a lot about overcoming fear of the unknown and respecting this vast amount of information that can come out of us, uh, come at us from the collective unconscious beyond these limitations of space and time, which as you say, can be quite overwhelming. It's quite confusing. Um, and we discovered this listeners in the riveting episode six with, uh, uh, about the collective unconscious and Jung's definition of the collective unconscious with the therapist, Monica Wickman. If you're interested in Jung, I know I'm sure there's going to be a few Jung addicts like me and Kyle out there in the audience. Um, Kyle, tell us, why is having a relationship with the unknown so important for integration? And, and feel free to introduce any important Jungian concepts uh, that you may think are relative, uh, relevant to us understanding this. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit just to explain what I was trying to do with the book, which was a, okay, right, yeah, certainly yeah, yeah. a journey of unknown for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, thinking about that, because it, it's all connected to me because that, that was part of my integration work. It's like, how do I integrate all these various ideas and concepts that I think are important or potentially useful um, while creating a guide for people to explore and, and explore these things, unknown parts of, of ourselves and possibility. And uh, with, since your listeners already learned about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and, and Jung, uh, I'll mention um, as a review, you know, there are three main phases that can be repeated in psychedelic psychotherapy, and that's preparation phase, the experience itself, the psychedelic experience, and the integration process. And when I was writing my book, I was trying to create a guide that could still stand alone from a psychedelic experience, that it could still help someone do some of these deeper explorations, whether or not they've had a psychedelic journey. And so the parallel I saw was with Joseph Campbell's three main phases of the hero's journey. And those are, and which our listeners are familiar with too, uh, departure, the trials of initiation, and the return. And so I saw that as being parallel with, uh, we'll just start with the first part, the preparation phase and the departure. And the way I framed it in my book is preparing as best we can, but also recognizing that, you know, there's only so much we can know in advance to what we are going to experience and what we'll face. And I thought the best strategy with that is really to expand our sense of awareness um, in, in a few different factors. One, in, an awareness of our what we know about space and time and our, our place in this small little rock in the cosmos. 
and the mysteries involved in that. What we know of our conscious minds and the depths of the conscious and unconscious and limits of our awareness, starting off with that. And then also the awareness of the present moment and this broader sense of mindfulness and the different aspects of our experience and phenomenology. So that was the the preparation phase in my book that I think parallels what we might do in uh, preparing for a journey, an inner journey, I'll say, of any depth and possibility. The preparation phase, this this awareness of the unknown, I think is just an honest place to start. And that was important to me. Like we can get in trouble in life when we feel like we figured everything out. When we, when we know all there is to know about ourselves or other people or the world, um, we can get in trouble because we're wrong. <laughs> we can't know all there is to know about any one thing. Um, there's that saying that that an awareness of what we don't know is the beginning of wisdom. And I very much believe in that. And that helps open our mind uh, in this preparation to, to see what's, what's possible and what we might experience and to prepare as best we can. In my book, I include some skills that we use actually in short-term cognitive behavioral therapy, some of it, uh, that can help just to, to go through difficult, challenging experiences or, or tolerating some of these unknowns while staying steady and fast. And uh, so that, that was my approach in this first arc of the book. Mm. And another of the themes uh, is existential exploration. And you connect this with initiation. Um, now, most societies use initiation as a way for individuals to kind of get used to certain important features of our existence. You know, I don't know, uh, life and death, solitude and interdependence, right and wrong, social, moral obligation, those kind of things. But sadly, our Western society has has lost many of its rites of passage and, uh, and community events that used to give young adults a sort of time and structure to, to integrate these realities. Tell me... The important things that you think we need to integrate into our worldview, and perhaps some ways that our Western society might reintroduce initiation. Yeah, this this is one of the most challenging uh, crises that we face, too, because it's not that these rights of initiation don't exist. They they still exist. Sometimes they've really lost meaning for people that go through them. Um, sometimes these rites of initiation are for a subgroup or subculture or community, um, but it doesn't apply to this broader sense of shared humanity or being part of life or confronting you know, our place in the cosmos. Uh, so there's lots of fractured sources of meaning, a lot of disillusionment in life, um, a lot of confusion. When thinking about this initiation phase, the second phase also being parallel to, parallel to a psychedelic journey, I thought one of the safest in the sense that it applies to all of us, but also more challenging ways to confront uh, trials within a, a book structure, a workbook structure, was actually to use some shared common fears and hopes and concerns and questions that we have pretty much merely for being human in this day and time. So a lot of existential thinkers and existential um, frameworks were, were of influence to me and, and my work in, in psychotherapy and personally. And those center questions and confrontations with things like mortality, death and, and loss, and I would say impermanence. Uh, so that's one of the first chapters in, in these trials. Also questions of loneliness or isolation, and then on the other end, impingement or social control and being lost in the, in the masses. And then finally, um, one of the most core ones is this sense of um, meaning versus meaninglessness, personal meaning versus the sense of absurdity or ambiguity of meaning or meaninglessness in the biggest sense. Like, how do we navigate these tensions, these fears, while we also have needs and desires related to each one of those and, and hopes? So I figured this would be a weighty trial. Um, again, I wrote the book so that it could stand alone from a psychedelic journey, 
Uh, but that means challenging things come up in psychedelic journeys and challenging things come up in psychotherapy. So we should be able to confront with, you know, some compassion and, and guidance um, for ourselves and, and for others, some of these bigger questions and then get to some of the fundamental uh, assumptions that we tend to make consciously or unconsciously about each of these issues and, and how we might be explore them. And I think that that approach of living the examined life, like really doing this deeper work does initiate us into a greater sense of um, shared humanity, because these, these questions apply to us. And, and if we can know ourselves as best we can, and we can know um, those lines about what we do know and what we don't and what, what may be true, then that's a way also to connect with others who are doing that deeper work. So it's an initiation in, into a, a bigger sense of mystery sometimes um, and, and questioning and exploration. And perhaps this this sort of losing of the taboo around, you know, pursuing mental health outcomes, positive mental health outcomes, the well-being revolution, um, you know, the fact that, shall we say, spirituality is becoming much less of a, of a taboo subject as well. It's not associated with the kind of dogma of religion. You know, maybe it's, it's, it's opening up for this kind of self-initiation process. Are there any dangers associated with the fact that that responsibility is being taken out of the hands of elders and communities and placed firmly in front of the individual? Yes, yeah, good question. And I, I do think there... There, even that like self-initiation, um, it can reinforce this fracturedness, right? If we we all come up with our own truths, our own worldview, um, I think that journey of doing that exploration is, is healthy. But how do we really recognize and incorporate this deeper truth that I, I feel, um, and there are multiple pathways to get here, of interconnectedness, the interconnectedness of us with other people, with the planet that we're on, with other life. You know, this is one of the lessons of the pandemic. I would hope people would, would come a, a, away with um, that, that this is a major theme. And so if we're really accepting and, and understand interconnectedness, then this is how we get reincorporated into this sense of social responsibility and the responsibility of bringing the insights I have from my own individual journey, my experiences into my relationships with others. Um, this is where we could get in kind of our, our values and the ethics of this work. Uh, so I think in my mind, at least when we're really exploring these major existential crises, we can do so or, or conflicts, we can do so without the burden of dogma and prepackaged uh, answers from other people, while also recognizing that we don't exist in isolation. And this brings us beautifully onto something that's that's already come up loads and loads of times today, and has been coming up all the way through the first series, which is meaning itself. And it seems to be right at the center of our mental health crisis in the West. I mean, some commentators have gone so far to say we're actually in a full-on meaning crisis. And I can't help feeling that this kind of reductionist scientific worldview that seems to have reduced everything, including ourselves, to sort of dead matter, um, it's really taking center stage in, in, this, in this new paradigm and then in this the new lack of meaning that so many of us are, are feeling. Tell us why, in your opinion, finding meaning is not only a responsibility, but perhaps even built into the experience of existence already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are a few different angles to look at this. Are we finding meaning, discovering it? Are we creating it individually? Are we co-creating it? Are we reconnecting with it? Are, are we deluding ourselves that there's meaning? Like, I, I think it's absolutely one of the, the core issues while not having kind of a shared sense of initiation and beyond various sub-communities. Um, but there are a few, few issues too. One, even for people who have a fairly clear sense of personal meaning or collective or even cosmic meaning, there can be a, a suffering related to dis, a disillusionment um, and a, a demoralization 
about putting that meaning into practice. And that that's a, a, an issue that that's big for people who do have a, a sense of meaning that's very clear. I think as humans, it's not uh, anything controversial say that we're meaning making creatures and animals that, you know, whether we believe intellectually or not that there, there is meaning or no meaning at all in, in the cosmos. Um, I, I prefer to think of it as like, no, for sure, known meaning. Like, again, that ambiguity is important to me that we, we are still living from a place of, of meaning and, and connections that we're making. Yeah conscious and, and unconscious, a lot of them unconscious. So I think the work in, in this uh, way is, is to embrace that this is part of the journey. This is part of where we're at now as, as a society and certainly globally for a lot of people, that there is a lot more ambiguity and uncertainty and meaning that we can recognize. It's not that that uncertainty wasn't there before or ambiguity wasn't there before, but now um, because of access to information and, and diverse cultures and very different worldviews, we were forced to confront that more now. But if we can embrace that that journey of exploring and, and discovering what our internal sense of meaning is, what the possibilities are, I think that can be a, a very healthy, if not also challenging, journey for us. Because once we come out the other end, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, we will have greater clarity about what our personal values are, what seems to really ring true to us about what's meaningful in our lives. Uh, maybe it's our relationships. Maybe it's the small stuff that really does matter more so um, than some of these, these bigger questions, uh, certainly the answers that we hope we have with these bigger questions. But it's through that, that journey um, that I, I think we can really be engaged in life. Psychedelic experiences, other powerful experiences, they can open the door to this re-enchantment of possibility and of life. And this materialistic worldview, um, scientism more than science. I, I love science, um, but it's more of this materialistic scientism that can make us think, and there are parallels in the spiritual community too, um, but it can make us think that we've already figured everything out, that that you know this is X Y Z is the meaning, or that there's no meaning. Like it's all this very black and white, not complex, um, and frankly boring and non mysterious uh, kind of worldview that that can get us down and make us closed off to possibilities. And I think that can be detrimental to our sense of well being. And that brings us full circle back to Joseph Campbell and this this very compelling model. Uh, of the hero's journey um, that you've used as a kind of structure for, for what a psychedelic journey, a therapeutic journey could be about. I mean, tell us why you were just so inspired by the hero's journey and why it is such a brilliant addition to, to Jungian idea of, of individuation. Well, it's an inspiring story, right? It, in its main form and how he talks about it, it is a way to look at life's challenges and in this deeper journey in a way that there is a hopeful ending, that there is something that we can attain through that. And it's even though it's been read as very individualistic, it's not really an individualistic journey uh, because one's community and one's allies and mentors is, is always a part that journey, a successful journey. And I think that's the return phase, right? Coming back to the community and bringing one's, what he called the elixir of life, um, the insights that we gain, the inspiration, the skills, the, the um, gifts that we can return to others and share with others so that we all can improve as a society and community and species even in, in the world. So that's very inspirational. And it does, it, doesn't do this thing and that is also very easy spiritual bypass if you just kind of skip to you know we're all connected you know life is inherently meaningful and it's easy we're, we're done like no there's still challenges in life there's still challenges in that journey so i appreciate that about uh campbell's work too the other thing that i i think we've lost sight of that is a, a good endeavor but can be problematic and has been problematic in Campbell's work and others is that there 
is this underlying uh, truth or shared humanity uh, kind of cross-cultural journey um, of meaning, right? That the mythic meaning. So he he did something that I think we need to do more of now and that addresses this sense of fracturedness, uh, looking across different cultures, across different stories, bringing them together, seeing what's shared, what's possible, integrating like the diversity of our, our various mythologies and, and very different cultures. I think that is a very worthwhile endeavor for us and one that that we we need to revisit and and a lot of the criticisms are about him coming from a very western centric worldview a very male dominant worldview he was a straight cisgender man in mid 20th century like this is not surprising this is this is true and that endeavor i i think is one that that we all should participate in and, and add complexity to it i think you've, you've had some other guests on that we're talking about some of the criticisms of Campbell's work. Um, and I, I love these conversations and because they can add complexity. It's not about dismissing an entire you know, set of ideas, but like how to, how do we repair this? How do we make it even better? Like that's passing the torch on to the next generation. Well, I wanted to ask you briefly about this. Um, Carla Stang, uh, the anthropologist in, in episode eight, listeners, she just blew my mind. We were talking about the importance of story um, to human understanding and human meaning. And, and we were talking about Joseph Campbell's um, hero's journey. And while acknowledging Campbell's brilliance, um, she makes this, I think, valid criticism saying uh, that the migration of the Indo-European cosmology into Southern Europe around about the 3rd century BC brought with them their particular mythology, which was very warrior-like, it was very individualistic, um, it was that kind of understanding of the monomyth into what would eventually become Western culture. And she makes the valid point, coming from working particularly with the Amazon, that not all stories and myths follow this, this egocentric pattern. Uh, she gives a beautiful example of uh, flower petals falling off uh, a, a flower, and that is a, a Japanese myth, just about the ephemeral nature of reality. And I think that, that, that it's, it's true that this is unnaturally dominant in the West, um, but for Westerners, that is, in fact, our cultural concept, context. So perhaps it's a sort of circularity that, that Campbell was drawn to, to that interpretation of the myths he was studying. What do you think of this criticism? Do you think this might be part of what we're missing? The fact that we, we struggle so much with the, 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 the ego mind and with this, this individualistic, self-centered approach to reality and to being interconnected. Well, absolutely. And I think Campbell didn't come from this place that the hero's journey was one that was actually about physically fighting, physically um, combating outsiders or reinforcing the ego. I think his perspective was was very different. It was about the, the symbolic meaning of, of, the of those battles. Yeah. 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 And that the, the dragon is actually our shadows. Um, the, the thing that we have to defeat the enemy is within, and we need to really confront that and integrate that. And so within all of our, our most engaging stories, sure, there are battles and fights like, you know, good guys versus bad guys. But I think we're adding complexity to that. And there's been complexity in, in our older myths, too, around good and, and evil. And that's the idea too of the shadow within Jung. It's not that it's the evil parts of ourselves. It, it, he described it as a moral problem, you know, that we have to reconcile our conscious mind, our conscious values, and our ego with the shadow as one of many different parts of ourselves. And then through this process of individuation, this integration of the different aspects of ourselves, this lifelong journey of becoming um, more of our individual selves as a byproduct of doing this deep, complex work where each of us are going to come up with our own kind of compromises and ways of integrating these complexities into our daily life, that that is the journey. That, that is the, the point of, of the hero's process. I like 
monomyth, and it's a bit of a misnomer versus calling it the hero's journey. It's a bit of a misnomer, though, because Campbell recognized, and I think we need to emphasize even more, that there are multiple myths, multiple mythologies, multiple stories within these different worlds. And to to say that something's inconsistent with the hero's journey, I, I think there have always been, and he speaks to different stories where the hero fails. Or there's a reversal, you know, the comic book and superhero mythology has been very popular in film. And again, this is my film studies coming back that I love. And we, we've needed these stories um, from different types of heroes. The, you know, the, I, I love the Doctor Strange movie is the most psychedelic of them I all. I love it. I love it too. <laughs> I can't wait for the second one. I can't wait. Me too. Yeah. Um, coming out this year. So we have that, but we, we need Black Panther. Uh, we need uh, Captain Marvel. We need, and these aren't, from my mind, these are not just like, you know, being PC or, or trying to, to have these different identity labels. Like we, we need stories where, we have our individual journeys. They can be different. There can be parallels, but we also come together and, and support one another. But we also need stories like Joker, right? Where we're telling the experience of, uh, we, we typically have viewed as the enemy from their point of view and, and how they got there. Uh, Joker is a great film because it, it really highlights too um, the challenges in modern society and the failures, the mental health failures is part of that, right? In our current system. We need all of these stories because all these stories can reflect different parts of our shared reality and the complexity of that. So um, this is true when thinking about, I, I love a lot of Japanese mythology and there's this idea when you're talking about the, the leaf petals, I, I think of this idea that actually integrated in into the book called Mono no Oware, the, the pathos of things, the, the beauty and the frailty and the impermanence of things like a flower and, and our lives in general, just an appreciation of that. It's not that the story ends with success for the hero all the time, or even ultimately the, the story goes on. Our story goes on past our individual lives and our various cultures um, and Campbell talked about this in the monomyth, the, the cosmogonic cycle, I think is what he called it too. Um, so th there's more to Campbell's work than how it's popularly interpreted, um, which I think does risk this kind of very individualistic journey that um, it, very Western minded and, and centric. And, and so I appreciate his work and his ideas and it's great that we have criticism of them where we, we can add other ideas. There's this um, heroine's journey and some of it's a reversal of the hero's journey. And um, Maureen Murdoch, I think, is the one who created that. Absolutely. She's a union and, analyst. And, yeah. And we, we yeah. go into Maureen Murdoch's take on this in, in that right. episode eight, uh, listeners, anyone who wants to get into that in detail. But, but, but Kyle, I just wanted to ask for maybe a little bit more depth here, because, you know, when we're talking about a psychedelic journey... It, that is really, you're in the depths of the unknown. You're right in the, yes. the, 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 the strange of the world. And you could quite often be facing some of your deepest fears, some of your deepest, most hidden pains. Yes. Give us a little kind of, maybe an example here of somebody really facing their shadow in that stage. And then talk about how coming out of that kind of experience... Um, someone might then go about integrating such an extraordinary image because I imagine something that comes up in a psychedelic experience is 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 quite a different way of dealing with, with it than any other form of therapy. I, I'm just really interested to hear it from from somebody who's who's prescribed this therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me clarify too that, you know, it's not currently legal in the United States. And, and so I don't prescribe or, or do the psychedelic um, experience guide work with people. I only practice above ground and I've only done that within legal context, like, like research. Mm. Um, so that's, that's really important just to highlight there. And I, I definitely do not come from the mindset that these experiences are for everyone because they can be so intense and create a lot of 
fear um, and other emotions in the moment. So I think that's part of the preparation work and, and all these kind of caveats to that. But for someone who's kind of said yes to that work and has access to that care and, and um, safe and ethical support, then it can create a, an opportunity to feel and experience these things in a, a much more deeply felt emotional way. And again, it can be symbolic, but you know, if you're confronting the shadow, there are going to be very uncomfortable feelings that, that you're having. Sometimes within a, a psychedelic journey, the, the shadow might be uh, symbolized as a, a scary figure or demonic figure. Um, and sometimes it's actually reflecting about your experience, your relationships, where you get to see, ah, maybe I wasn't living up to my values there, or maybe I was blaming this other person, but I should take some responsibility for things that I did. And, In the and sense so that, that they might relive those experiences, because that's something that's that comes up in a lot of um, uh, ayahuasca experiences, where people are reliving the exact experience, but from the perspective of somebody else in the room. Does mm -hmm. that come up? Yeah, that that's absolutely a possibility. And, you know, there... So these experiences, right, it depends on, on dose. So at, at lower doses, it may not be a reliving, but a, a reflection of this experience from a different perspective, right? And that's a big part of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder is coming at these memories, these traumatic memories from a different perspective. So however... You, you look at it, there is a confrontation to various degrees of intensity of these, these experiences and a meaning making that's done there. But you have to be able to tolerate and feel safe enough to experience this, this fear or this guilt. Um, so then the once you make it through that journey, it's a temporary state, right? The integration work uh, could look like making meaning from this experience and then actually a, applying this different perspective and how I go about my relationships or how I go about um, some of my major life choices. Like how do I stay safe, for example? So, and so it's hard to um, talk about any grand principle with the psychedelic journey, just because I've seen and heard from so many people, and you probably have too, just how very different these experiences can be. And, um, but the emotional intensity is, is a good sign that you're confronting something that's, that's deeply buried and uh, that, that you typically aren't processing uh, in your everyday life. And would you lead people directly to those things during, you know, when they are actually, shall we say, high for want of a bit of a word, but once they're actually really feeling the, the psychotropic effect, do you try and lead them back to those experiences like, deliberately? So with the current approach and in, in the research with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, that's a good one to, to use as an example, because even though it's not a classic psychedelic, uh, it's the furthest down the, the pipe in terms of these the research, the modern research. There is a invitation to go back to some of these memories, to the trauma itself, or based on someone's intention, to an in, there's an invitation in the moment to go towards some of these questions or areas of exploration, but it's never something that you force on someone, right? And, and that's really critical too, because uh, sometimes we can have this um, kind of, this is part of maybe the, the masculinity, the over-masculine kind of perspective on the hero's journey. Uh, you you got to do the toughest work. You got to do, um, help someone grow, you know, if you're the facilitator. And that can be re-traumatizing and can do a lot more damage than good. And so we, we want to be very uh, ethical in our approach to this and reduce any of the risk and harm. But if there's an invitation there, then the person can, what I think is very powerful, have their own sense of agency activated so that they can make a more conscious choice. You know, do I feel prepared for this? Do I feel ready for this? Do I feel safe enough in the moment to go there? Um, and we talked about the three phases of psychedelic therapy, the, the prep, the medicine session, and the integration. 
Um, but those are repeated. They're repeated in the MDMA um, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. There's at least two medicine sessions. So, you know, it's, it, it's not always a missed opportunity. It's just like, not now, like this, this journey or this experience is, is about getting used to this non-ordinary state. It's about feeling safe to be in a non-ordinary state with two therapists there. Right. Hmm. So, um, I, I think that's really important to recognize that it, it's not this just, you know, do the toughest work as soon as possible, that that, that can backfire very much. Well, well, also, you know, hypnotherapy comes to mind where we have this sense, and actually this is part of the Jungian model, isn't it, that the mind knows where to mm -hmm. take you and what you need to experience at that moment in the sense that it would never reveal more than was required you know, stage by stage, you know, a lot of these traumatic experiences are sealed in memory for a good reason. And I think that was one of my questions was really such a sort of, um, for want of a better word, because it's not always like this, but it is quite aggressive in terms of, of, of an, a complete change of your state of mind and your state of being. My concern might be that you're sort of throwing the, the doors open um, the doors of perception, uh, perhaps before the mind is ready. And I was just wondering, you know, for example, holotropic breath work does this brilliantly, Stan Groff's method, um, that, that sort of, but the mind just takes you, takes you as far as you need to go that day. Do you find the same thing happening with psychedelics? Because there is a lot of talk about plant medicine having its own sort of emotional intelligence, as it were. Do you think we can trust psychedelics not to take people too far more than they're ready for? Mm. I would say, to be honest, I kind of keep the jury out on that a little bit because I've heard plenty of stories where it, it didn't seem like a healing journey for someone, that it was actually re-traumatizing. And this is not about the medicine itself. It's also about the context, right? Right. Um, where people are doing it, how much they're doing, how prepared they were, who they're with. Mm. So there are a lot of other factors at play here. Certainly this, this idea of there being what's sometimes called the inner healing intelligence or the inner healer, the capital S self and the internal family systems model, which is a, a, a little bit nicer than the capital S self and Jung's model. Um, Jung's model is it, the self is the totality of conscious and unconscious. So um, it, it is the godlike image um, in all of its forms. So this, this mentality or this idea and concept is one that is very useful clinically in helping people prepare and to trust themselves, trust the parts of themselves that are, are wanting and willing to heal or to transform or feel ready to go deeper or to experience something that is challenging in, in, in their past or in their every, uh, every day life. Um, so I, I think in the right context with the right support and um, that it, that it's a, a pretty on average, a, a pretty safe model. Um, but there, there are all these factors that are at play there. So I just, I highlight this because I want us to be a little cautious. And I, I think one of the bigger risks too, in this movement right now is this magic bullet transference that the psychedelics are going to, to automatically heal or transform people or give them exactly what they need. And that's certainly not always the case. Well, um, and it's, it's but, certainly one of my concerns is this kind of, the fact that we're so used to medication as well as, as a sort of quick fix. And this idea that using a sort of um, a, a mind changing medication gives you this kind of sort of direct route, shortcut, you don't need to do the work. Um, it's a very sort of Western tendency. And as I'm sort of a bit like, okay, let's take it easy. You know, guys, how many ayahuasca journeys do you really need? You know, kind of mm -hmm. questions. But this does, because of, you know, you've mentioned the word cosmic uh, several times now. You know, we do in the community of people interested in psychedelic research, we do find a lot of talk about these higher realities, um, higher consciousness, this kind of thinking that obviously is, is murky and difficult for science to map, but it does bring us on to your final arc and this, this big one 
which seems to be very, very close to the objectives of Jungian individuation. This aim to move beyond our biggest limitations, to integrate everything that we've taken from that, something that you're associating with the return, where we bring home the, the, the sort of harvested learnings of that. Tell us about the joys that await us if we can use these tools and take these existential explorations to their limits. Uh, what What's there for us? And, and again, I don't think this is just for people suffering from mental health issues. I think this is for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's for everybody. Yeah. And, and that that's a big focus of my book. It's It's not a book about therapy per se or, you know, mental health treatment it's about how do we all do this deeper work and and integrate um, a greater sense of our, ourselves and what's most important to us and i i think that is is part of this is an ongoing journey and it's not a quick fix uh, there's still that ambiguity that we all have to grapple with but i think by asking these deeper questions by being willing to explore and to experience and feel deeply that we can get a better handle on uh, the most important things to us in our lives and to be, become more what we call psychologically flexible in how we approach each situation, each relationship, to have some guideposts, some, some compass uh, values that we have clarified for ourselves that we can use along the way, but also recognize um, that, that we can uh, be flexible, like bamboo. That's a, a metaphor that I like that I bring into the book and how we approach things and that we continue to learn, we continue to grow, that this is not some destination that we get to. And that provides, again, I think the sense of possibility, a, a sense of a, a very personal meaning. And part of the joys of this and reconnecting to deep feeling as we can also reconnect to deep feeling of, of joy and contentment and happiness and connection too, um, by opening ourselves up to, to our, our feelings and to just this human experience. And um, one of the, the joys I, I think is a, a greater sense at, at minimum creative artistic appreciation, um, ability to, by being flexible psychologically to problem solve in creative ways. Uh, in, in maybe even to create some symbolic elixir of life yourself, um, whether it's an art piece, um, a podcast, right? Something that is going to serve and hopefully inspire others. It doesn't have to inspire everyone, um, but if it inspires one other person, it can be as simple as acts of kindness, that that is a part of this journey of, of healing that we need to do that goes beyond our individual experiences. But it's being open to that work and and really doing the the harder challenging parts so that we can get to the other side as well. So the the joy and the pain. Is there anything else you want to add about that final arc? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a journey. I mean, in many ways that the the end is a big part of why I wrote the book to to get to that place. But it's a a, a journey, right, that we go through um, in thinking about how we engage with Joseph Campbell, for example, and that, that hero's journey. Uh, it's it creates a structure. But when we get to the end, we part of creativity is realizing that we can give up that structure, we can surrender it, and um, that that's when we we're kind of at the edges of, of human understanding and and possibility again, and and that we can be co-creators on our path, certainly of our individual lives and our collective one. And I, I think that's very empowering. And that's where we can have a sense of possibility and re-enchantment, not as a way to deny what the challenges that we have personally or in life, but to, to feel uh, some empowerment that we don't have to surrender in an unhealthy way. We don't have to fall victim to what's being thrown at us, that we can adapt and, and we can help steer our, our path. Yeah. Just before we close, Carl, I want to come back to this idea of the unknown because, um, as I said, it, it, it is strongly present in Jung's work. And I think if we follow the logic through, we have ourselves feeling as uh, separate beings, uh, despite a lot of physics and psychology starting to to show that really we're, we're much more connected than maybe we are led to believe by our senses. But 
you know, we have this sense of separateness. And so because we have a sense of separateness, there are vast swathes of reality outside of us that appear to be unknown. And there is a fear associated with that. But this idea of mystery and, and the excitement of mystery. So I want to come back to this idea of coming to making friends with the unknown. Uh, which is something with with my kids I talk about a lot where they're they're facing certain fears or whatever it's just like wow but but actually that could be a friend you just can't see them you know it's this sort of exciting mysterious thing that you can go out and you can even create what it is in your mind and and, and discover it what do you think is the importance maybe you know maybe coming from a Jungian point of view but not necessarily of making friends with the unknown why is it so important well the the first thing that comes to mind again is just that it's honest right <laughs> there is unknown um there are things that we we can't know or we don't know now and that gives us a lot of opportunities though and and things that we can learn the possibility that things aren't set in stone that are our life or our experience or our worldview that we have now uh, isn't isn't complete. That this is an unfolding process, and and to me that that gives a lot of uh, it sparks my curiosity, but it gives a lot of hope about life. You know, there are going to be challenges alongside uh, possibilities and successes, and uh, ideally, I feel like if I'm doing my my work honestly and and, and fully. Then I'm I'm going to be learning things. It may not get rid of the unknown because uh, that's impossible. But I'm going to be growing. I'm going to be expanding my my awareness from my starting place. And for me, and this is part of my kind of personal values, uh, that's meaningful. And and it's great and inspiring to get connected with that sense of curiosity again and of possibility. And and whilst maintaining some sense of grounded agency, right. That, that I am making choices and I can make choices uh, even in the face of unknown that are in line with, with what I hope is possible in my life. Big and that's how we connect with meaning. Big motivators, aren't they? They really get us out of bed in the morning, those curiosities. So beyond the narrow life, listeners, you must go out and get this new book, uh, Psychedelic Integration and the Exist an Existential Exploration. Kyle, just to get a sense of this, who is your target reader here? Are we talking about this is for, for therapists or, or is this for anybody interested in the psychedelic research? I, I wrote it for all of the above, but I think that the target person is going to be someone who is... Um, kind of self-motivated to ask these questions and they are willing to put in the work and try out different exercises. I have a lot of different exercises throughout the book that people can choose from to help them personalize their journey, their experience. I've, I've heard a lot from therapists like the cosmos, for example, which they haven't, that's not part of our training program to talk about the cosmos, right? <laughs> In psychology you know, with a PhD or otherwise. Um, so it's helpful for them. And uh, you know, that for therapists and coaches too, they can kind of pick and choose different exercises that are helpful for their clients and what the goals are. And I've used it in all the above ways uh, with my clients. I wrote it to be again, independent of psychedelic experiences. So uh, for someone who's wanting to do just these deeper explorations psychologically, then, then it, it has everything you need there too. Well, uh, if you're a self-starter and you like to do the work yourself, then, then by all means you can do it. Pace yourself though. That's one of my number one recommendations. It's not something that you pick up and, and you complete within a week or even a month. And like you were saying about Jung, it's like we're going to be learning this stuff till the very last second of our life. So there's no hurry, is there? Right, so, exactly. Yeah. Kyle, thank you so much for your time and wishing you all the very best with the promotion of the book and with the future of your career. Um, and it just leaves for me to thank you on behalf of the listeners for giving this great insight into psychedelic integration. So all the best. Thank you so much, Kyle. My pleasure, Freddie.